Good morning, and welcome to another Moments with Michael. Today's topic is transactional language. Okay, so transactional language, what is it? This is one of these things that I did not know um, when I started my journey parenting my exceptional child. So with my boy Gabriel, um, he never exhibited any kind of speech delay. So here he was at about oh, a year and a half. Gabby, look, butterflies. Butterflies. So he could speak, but transactional language refers to language used to exchange information, make requests, and engage in conversations with a specific purpose. Um, transactional language is so important in daily interactions and in academic settings in particular. Um, and developing transactional language skills enhances comprehension, expression, and social interactions. So creating language rich environments. Um, and I love this handout, um, your words matter. And it kind of reminds me of something that my father once said to me when I was complaining about my work conditions. And I said, dad, this doesn't work. What we're doing doesn't work. And I said it over and over and he said, son, you can't just say what doesn't work. You have to specify what you think will work. In other words, tell them what to do, not just what not to do. So instead of be quiet, okay, that is telling them what to do, but doesn't give them an alternative. Instead, try, can you use a softer voice? That way I'm already implicitly saying, I need you to stop using the loud voice you were using and to use a softer voice instead. Um, on towards the bottom there, um, this really got me thinking about the implicit things that our kids hear us say um, when we don't say the actual words. For instance, um, I'm sure I've said it um, to my students at least uh, that, hey, this is not that hard. Really? It's not that hard. But saying it to our children can give them the impression that, oh, Daddy's saying this isn't that hard, but yet I'm struggling with it. So maybe there's something wrong with me. It's a terrible feeling for a child to have. So instead, I say, you can do hard things. Gives them kind of a hopeful note. And the last one down there, we don't talk like that. Again, gives them a negative thing not to do, but instead saying, please use kind words. And so I'm implicitly saying, we don't talk like that, but instead we use kind words, something to think about. So this next um, handout is another one of those things, uh, the good job phenomenon. One of the things that um, I started uh, noticing uh, once I read it somewhere and now can't stop noticing is how often in particular uh, adults say good job to children. Just pay attention to it the next time you're around adults and children and how much you hear adults say, good job, good job, good job. And the problem with good job is that, well, it's twofold. One, it's overused to the point that just like um, exclaiming at your child in the grocery store to watch out, like it only really um, maybe changes their behavior in just that moment and you'll end up repeating it. And two, another problem with good job is that you're not relaying a lot of information at all. So to go back to my example of um, something that my child is attempting to do, um, instead of saying good job, when kids try hard and still fail, you can say, I see you really want to get this right. What else can you try? All right. You really want to figure this out. Is there another way we can look at this problem? So that way you're giving recognition for the effort um, in the results that they've gotten thus far, but you're giving them further encouragement to keep trying. Um, 
in the bottom example there, instead of saying, good job when a child shows off a piece of work, you can say, look at that. I can tell you put a lot of work into it. Tell me about what you did. Show me more. Wow, how did you do that? That looks like it took a lot of effort. That way you're giving more feedback than just that generic good job. And it's just one of those things, the good job, I just think the kids stop hearing it after a while or stop deriving any new meaning from it. So active listening is something that's always been very important, um, particularly with our uh, little man. And I, I did notice that when I was doing birth decay intakes um, last year, that there were two questions on the form uh, that I was to ask parents. One was, can you understand what your child is saying? Two, can other people understand what your child is saying? So active listening is very important. We kind of just do it naturally living with our kids. Um, we kind of interpret what they mean to say, even though their meaning may not be clear to a third party. So in this little tiny clip, we're playing around with photo filters and Gabe is going to um, say something about the, or rather ask something about the beard that he has. And I'm going to restate what he said. Gabe, what do you think of your beard? Why is it? Why, why do you have a beard? <laughs> so just notice he says, why is it? It isn't quite grammatically correct. It may not be clear to someone who doesn't know him what he's what he's asking or what he means to communicate. But instead, I reframe and restate what he said, um, rather to make it more clear and to kind of model appropriate language use. Open-ended questions can be so much fun. I'm thinking about how much um, television programming is dedicated to. Um, kids say the darndest things and stuff like that. Um, we've had a lot of fun um, asking questions uh, to kids. It might be a little bit above their head, but just to see what they'll come up with. But um, this is so rewarding to do with your kids. And so here's a little clip um, when uh, I'm driving Gabriel in the car. Say hi, Mommy. Hi. Where are we going? We're not going to Pennsylvania. We're going to Baltimore. So there you can see him asking him, where are we going today? So instead of just throwing him in the car and driving down the road, like I'm attempting to involve him in the process, sort of like by asking him, like, where are we going? Like, wh what are we doing right now? Like that open-ended questions is just awesome to do with your kids. Say hi, mom. <clears throat> Providing real life experiences. Now, this is where I have really tried to incorporate a lot of the lessons taught to us um, by uh, therapists, case managers, uh, speech language pathologists, and that, um, you know, I always feel it's important to acknowledge um, the negative feelings, the overwhelm that it can be um, as the parent of an exceptional child. And so it did occur to me um, after getting so much feedback about how to help or things to try, I thought, do I need to quit my job and just spend full time um, working on this stuff with Gabriel? But instead, I kind of found a way to, I don't know, I guess do it all for uh, lack of a better word in the moment, um, by incorporating um, techniques to uh, encourage him to use transactional language in what we're doing every day. So in this example here, Gabe is obviously enjoying a um, band playing outdoors at a restaurant. <laughs> So after that bit of dancing, we encourage Gabe, like, why don't you go talk to that guy? 
talk to that guy holding the harmonica. Ask him um, what he's doing, like what, what kind of music. You just go some, have some kind of conversation. Go and talk to him. So that's the kind of thing we try to do. Utilizing visual aids and contextual clues. Um, I see this um, really heavily pushed um, at the preschool level where um, preschool teachers use that visual uh, schedule and that you'll actually see them um, say like, okay, playtime is almost over and they're pointing to an icon of kids at play or some kind of picture. And then the next one is after playtime is circle time in which again, the graphic becomes kids seated in a circle. And so pairing that visual with the verbal is a great way to help with that early language development and certainly something we've done. Scaffolded conversations. Now here's another one of thing, one of the things like transactional language that I really didn't understand until it was explained to me. And if you think about it, like scaffolding um, in the construction sense refers to that like armature, that uh, construction that goes on outside of a building that allows workers to crawl up and traverse via ladders and so forth. But scaffolding just really means supporting. So what I'm talking about is structure conversations, gradually increasing the complexity and length of exchanges by providing prompts, sentence starters, or visual supports to support children's language production. So here I'm going to try to um, give, give Gabe some prompts to explain um, how even though he's got these water muscles on, uh, he doesn't want to go to the pool. So we're going to try to um, hash that out as to why he doesn't want to go. Gabe, are you ready to go to the pool? Yeah, no, I don't want to go to the pool. You want to go to Dewey Beach? So it's a little hard to hear there, but he said, I don't want to go to the pool. And so I immediately follow up with, do you want to go to Dewey Beach? Because I knew that he had really like talked a lot about that after we had went there some years ago. So I'm trying to tease out of him. What is it about the water that you don't like? And it was just one of those passing aversions that lasted a long time, but we finally did overcome. Good, are you ready? Creative problem solving. This can be really uh, cool, uh, almost as fun as open-ended questions um, to engage children in discussions to solve problems, make decisions, or plan activities. So here's a little clip of Gabe with a speech language pathologist, <clears throat> and she's gonna ask him a question. Oh yeah, and he's digging up the garden. Look, what does he dig up? So you see the therapist say, what does he dig up? And in this case, I mean, it was something like a magic bone or something. So the next question would be, how is he going to use that magic bone to save the day? And so that's where we get into the problem solving, like trying to engage in a conversation in which you're um, getting your little one to explain like how you think the situation is going to be resolved. Yeah. Good stuff. Offering constructive feedback can be very fun too. Um, providing specific praise and guidance to help children improve their communication skills. So in this little clip, um, you're going to see Gabriel's sister, Alora, offer him some uh, uh, questions on flashcards. But in this instance, Gabe has figured out that if he gives the wrong answer, then Alora is going to react in a humorous way. And this is much more rewarding than the praise of getting the answer right. But implicit in him giving the wrong answer every time means that he knows what the right one is. So sometimes it works like this in an exceptional children's life. <laughs> Here it is. Which one is coming out? No! <laughs> Which one is coming outward? The tunnel. Which one's the first one coming out? No! <laughs> okay, Gabe. Which one is facing forty? Tell each other. Toward each other. 
No! <laughs> which, which one is facing not toward each other? No! <laughs> Which one is coming? All right. So I've always got my uh, videos that I want to plug on the um, WCPS Special Education Parent Portal under the Family Support Resource Center. Um, check them out. Building things at home for an exceptional child. I want to end this um, presentation by um, sort of sharing where we're at right now in this phenomenon that we're encountering in that um, Gabriel has, um, through his life, experienced periods of stuttering. It has most frequently in the past taken the form of getting stuck on the first word of a sentence, like, where are we? So the first word's kind of bumpy, and then the rest comes out smoother. But right now we're in rather um, a severe period of stuttering. And I just took this video about two weeks ago um, I, this would have been December 2023. So this is a little bit of a conversation we had the other morning. Gabe, Gabe, pause that for a second. What special are you going to have today? Uh, uh, I d d d d don't know. Hey, wait, what's your favorite thing to do at school? Math. No, 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 no. Okay, but my, my favorite special is, is art. Yay. So this, this stuttering is pretty pronounced um, and it's, it's, it's really kind of hard to watch in some sense that he's like struggling to get syllables out in the middle of a sentence. But his speech language pathologist said something that jumped right out at me um, last month. She said um, something about scripting and I was like, oh, he's not scripting as much as he used to. So whenever he's alone and isn't addressing someone else, but he's vocalizing things, he's typically scripting and that he'll say something um, just accompanying a video that he's watching and be like, oh, the, the, the cold island Wubbux is dancing all around. And all that language is pretty smooth coming out. But it's the fact that he is, our best guess is that, um, because he is constructing more original responses, like I'm asking him to answer a specific question about his life, what is his favorite thing to do in school? He's having to really, for the first time, like construct his own responses consistently. And that's where we're seeing that stuttering in there. So it's just one of those things that we're dealing with right now. You know, we're determined to keep at it. We've added it as a goal. Uh, with our speech language pathologists and you know i just want to continue or urge you to continue um working with your child and um keep at this game we call transactional language we'll see you next time this has been moments with michael